presentation. Uh, I hope um, that uh, this will be interesting to you. I won't be talking about population genetics, uh, although it's a big part of my training, uh, but uh, I will talk to you about cardiovascular research, which is a new orientation for me. Uh, I uh, did not train in that field, but I train in genetics, genomics, and I, I, we are uh, applying uh, omics tools uh, now to uh, cardiovascular uh, disease research. Uh, just before starting, I want to present to you my research group. Uh, so those are uh, people that joined my lab um, in the last two years uh, and that to do most of the work, obviously, and I wanted to thank them uh, to, uh, up front. Uh, and uh, the work I will be talking to you about today are mainly done in collaboration with the help of uh, Pamela Mehana and Jean-Christophe Grenier, who are my bioinformaticians uh, in the group. Um, uh, and in the group, we have this mandate uh, of trying to integrate and use uh, data science in medical and health uh, sciences. And I think that most of you will uh, be, um, uh, it, th this w will be familiar to most of you. We all are all trying to do this, uh, or a lot of us are trying to do this in bioinformatics. Um, and so, yes, we want to develop, implement, and use computational approaches to analyze omics data, and especially here uh, in the context of uh, the, the era of big data, where we have data from everywhere coming to us, uh, and also in the context of multi-omic world, where, so I don't think I need to necessarily describe this uh, picture to you, uh, but uh, we have data coming from genomics, epigenomics, transcriptomics, proteomics, and metabolomics nowadays, uh, and we are trying to understand phenotypes. Um, and as I said, I'm interested in evolution as well, human evolutions, uh, and so we're trying to bring all of this together in my group. Um, we have several projects, uh, some in collaboration with clinicians and fundamental researchers at the Montreal Hyde Institute, uh, we also have uh, projects in pharmacogenomics uh, and in cardiofertility, but for today, I'll mainly uh, talk to you about two uh, projects of omics uh, of pulmonary hypertension and metabolomics of uh, myocardial infarction. But just before, just to be sure that everyone is on the same page uh, in terms of the cardiovascular uh, uh, background that uh, I, uh, I am still learning at the cardiovascular, uh, at the Montreal Heights Institute. I just want to make sure uh, that uh, I'm very clear about the different phenotypes. So, um, so people are, are using heart attack and cardiac arrest uh, interchangeably, but it's actually very different type of phenotypes. Uh, and so um, heart attack, it, so you can see that maybe it's a, a strange analogy, but you can see that if you're thinking about it, you know, a house, so the heart attack would be a plumbing, plumbing issue. The cardiac arrest will be more of an electrical issue, so it's, it's more that um, you, uh, the entire heart it stops because it stops beating. Uh, and the heart failure is um, more of a pumping issue, where the muscle itself is uh, not necessarily working properly, but it doesn't mean it, that you have a heart attack when you have heart failure, it's just damage to the entire muscle, whereas the heart attack itself uh, will, so it, it will be uh, um, a rupture or a blockage of an artery, no blood, damages to the muscle, but only part of the muscle would be uh, affected. So those three things are, are different, and of course they affect other uh, uh, organs and the most direct one or one of the very direct ones are the, the lungs uh, where a heart attack for example will uh, uh, clearly lead to uh, problems uh, or often lead to problem in pulmonary circulation uh, which could lead uh, to uh, pulmonary fibrosis and also heart failure in some sense. So all of this is connected of course. And so, um, with Dr. Um, with Dr. Jocelyn Dupuis at the Montreal Heart Institute, we're trying. We're working on a project of type two pulmonary hypertension. Pulmonary hypertension 
this type of pulmonary hypertension is the one that is uh, caused by or follows at least myocardial infarction. So someone would have a heart attack and then would develop problems in the lungs. Um, and one issue of these, so there's many types, but that type 2 pulmonary hypertension doesn't have treatment. So people receive uh, the, uh, the valsartan uh, molecule, which is a, a medication that uh, is used for heart failure and hypertension, but it's not specifically developed for uh, pulmonary hypertension, and so there's no treatment specifically for that. Uh, but the Prometic uh, uh, Montreal-based company, actually, has developed a, a molecule, a small compound that is called PBI4050, uh, and that has uh, shown in different studies uh, promising effects, especially uh, Dr. Dupuis' group has shown that this molecule reduces right ventricular hypertrophy and lung fibrosis, so it, it's beneficial in rats, uh, when it's given three weeks after the, uh, the, the myocardial infarction. Uh, and so the next step of the, that study was to, to try to test whether uh, uh, giving that molecule, the, giving that treatment earlier than three weeks uh, was also going to be beneficial uh, in patients because waiting three weeks is not, very, uh, not necessarily a good uh, uh, strategy. So um, here we're looking at rat uh, studies, so rat transcriptomic study. Uh, this, um, um, this pipeline is uh, the, the, the one that they use not only for the transcriptomics, but they've done a lot of cardiophenotyping on these rats. And so you can see that there was a saline group where they were not treated with uh, the medication. We had the PBI group treated with the medication, uh, and, it's, and I, I want to emphasize that it's 48 hours post MI. So they, uh, they uh, generate an MI in the rats, and then um, they're treated uh, 48 hours later. Valsartan has, has been given to some of the population, and then you have also the group that has the combined treatment. And so there were um, 36 rats that were taken out of, of this study, and uh, we did a transcriptomic uh, study on these, so the transcriptomic data was generated, um, five weeks after DMI, so after the treatment was given, and that the rats could uh, have recovered somehow. So there were six groups, so the sham saline, so sham, if you're, you're not uh, familiar, is uh, they get the operation, uh, but they don't get the myocardial infraction generation. Uh, so sham salines, sham PBI, so I'll switch to PBI, uh, to say PBI 450. Um, and then, so th the rats that had the MI and the saline treatment, or uh, MI PBI, MI valsartan, and then the MI with the combined uh, treatment. So the questions here are, first of all, just basically what is the effect of MI on the transcriptome of these rats? And second, what is uh, the different effects of the treatments on the transcriptome? So I won't go through all the details here. There's lots of quality control that has been going on, but basically we've sequenced uh, by using RNA-seq those 72 samples. So here. Uh, 36 rats, but we, sequ we uh, took tissue from lungs and from the right ventricular to have two tissue for each rat. Uh, so they're paired, so they're matched. Uh, we've used Callisto and Lima as tools to, uh, to process the um, uh, RNA-seq data. I'm happy to give more details if uh, you want, uh, and then we did a lot of QC, so again, I'm not going to go into details, but, you know, PCA, Excel, which is an analysis to look at the different enrichment in the different cell types. Uh, we've looked at, we compare lung and, and right ventricular to see how uh, these differ, and also different things such as mitochondrial percentage and so on to correct for most of the hidden or the the potential technical biases in our data, and then we proceed to analysis. So um, 
I don't know how familiar you are, you are with uh, volcano plots. Briefly, what we're looking at here are each dot is a gene uh, that is, has been expressed, uh, has passed our threshold of you know, being expressed in that tissue. And then uh, each dot is represented here as uh, with the, the x-axis being the log2 fold change, so the actual effect. So for example, if the log fold change uh, is one, it means that it doubled. Um, and uh, on the y-axis, you have the p-values, the, the statistical significance. Uh, so the, the genes that are actually here, so at high p-value and high fold change, are the ones that are most likely to be interesting to study. So we can color them as up-regulated or down-regulated if fold change. So here we're always taking, so in this case, we're taking the, the Shams line as, sorry, I lost my, the Shams line as a reference, and we're looking at whether they're up-regulated, down-regulated, or non-significant. So significant here, I use it as significant in the sense of statistical significance. We have to take into account multiple comparison. Of course, so we're using the uh, false discovery rate approach, uh, but also biological significance in the sense that we want things that are actually an effect, a, a big enough effect. So here it's a threshold, it's arbitrary. We take the log two full change of more than one, uh, the, the absolute value more than one. And so as you can see here by the colors, uh, there's many genes that are uh, uh, modulated during the myocardial infarction. So here we have the sham saline and the MI saline, and so we're looking at the profile, the change in, pro in, in uh, transcriptomic profiling uh, for those rats that had the myocardial infarction. Uh, and so depending on your threshold, you have different uh, genes, and we uh, go back to our collaborators and they identify some of the genes that they already know about, which is always reassuring because we know we've done something good, but also new things, and sometimes the most significant are new things that they didn't know about, and so they're going to, uh, we're, we're going to pursue a lot more uh, on these to understand how these, uh, these different things, uh, these different genes uh, are modulated and how it could impact so the actual mechanism of what's going on in the lungs, so here it's lung tissue, after a myocardial infarction. If we're looking at the heart tissue, so it's the right ventricle, um, we see nothing. So <laughs> nothing was really interesting, so as you can see, uh, there's nothing significant in terms of p-values. Um, so it's a good news for us in the sense that it's possible to see nothing. Uh, but it's also, it also means that clearly what's going on is more in the lungs than uh, in the, the, the right uh, ventricular. Then we can look at treatments. So here, the reference group is MI saline. Um, it's, uh, so we're looking at the difference between MI saline, so the ones that had the myocardial infarction but no treatment, and the group here that has PDI again we don't see much going on. So that was uh, a bit disappointing. But with Balzartan, we don't either see a lot going on in terms of the genes that are being uh, uh, upregulated, modulated by treatment. However, in the combined treatment, <laughs> all of a sudden we see a lot of things going on. And so that was uh, an interesting result. Some of these genes also are shared with the genes that we saw as being significant in uh, the other analysis. And then we can also look at uh, those, those genes, whether they are. So here, I'm comparing those two volcano plots. I don't want you to look necessarily for the genes. I'm showing here the genes that are shared. And as you can see, they, so uh, on the x-axis, it's the effect, so the full change for the Valzartan PBI versus the Sham saline. And on the y-axis is the MI saline versus the combined treatment. So you can compare these two, and you see that the effects are completely in the opposite direction, meaning that in one, in, in one analysis, one gene would go uh, in one direction, and then it would come back 
to its initial state, state uh, in the second, which uh, makes us confident that actually this group is supposed to be better, going back to something similar to uh, the, 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 the non-affected uh, non group. Um, so, the, so then uh, it, it, let's verify that. We have the rat, we have the phenotype, the cardiophenotyping. Um, and so first of all, there was no significant effect of uh, PBI, Valsartan, or combined therapy on the left ventricular scars. That's important because they could measure the actual uh, strength of the myocardial infarction, and the, none of the treatment um, uh, showed differences in terms of that. Uh, however, there was significant, there were significant improvement in pulmonary hypertension and ventricular function, uh, as well as right ventricular hypertrophy, but only in the combined treatment group, which corroborates uh, absolutely with what we've seen in our analysis. So that was good news. Uh, so the cardiophenotyping of the rats and the transcriptomic uh, tell us the same things. And uh, now with the transcriptomic data, we also have a way of going further into the results to actually uh, identify the pathways and uh, the biology that is involved in the establishment of um, the recovery of these rats. So how do we do that? Because we ha I showed you there was lots of genes. Um, so there's many ways. So first thing we can have a look at the expression heat map. So here, what we did is we selected all the genes that were significant at a FDR level of 1% in one of our comparisons. And we, uh, we um, look at the heat map. We clustered the sample according to their expression patterns. And as you can see here, the shams line are clustering. We are seeing some of the, MI, the combined treatment also on that side of the, 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 the grouping, uh, and so on. Um, so that's one kind of information we can get out of this. Then we can summarize everything using a spanning tree approach. So the idea here is to create a graph that is a subset of edges that link the, that link the different samples. And um, so it's a, it's a graph that doesn't have cycles, and that is the minimum, minimal possible uh, total edge weight. So this is uh, briefly what, what this is. Uh, and so, as you can see, uh, Cham uh, Saline over here clustering with uh, so the, the combined, uh, and then you have all the other MI uh, samples, except for P65, we're not exactly sure what's going on here. Um, but uh, he, this individual uh, seemed to have a bit of trouble recovering. Uh, but on the other side, we have all these samples clustering together in a way where we can start to see uh, a, 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 a progression. So these ones would be the ones that are recovering the most. Uh, we can interpret it this, this way. We can then go also and look at um, uh, specific pathways. So progeny provides some uh, gene grouping in different uh, pathways that are known to be important in different aspects of biology. And so we can then look. So those box plots are um, the, um, the different enrichment for the, gene, the expression of these genes in different categories. So we can see different patterns. We can see patterns where, the, um, for example, in the P53 pathway, where the, the combines seem to go back to something more similar to the Shams line. Um, we have this also in the M uh, the, the MAP kinase uh, pathway. Um, and then we have other, other patterns, right? So here you see uh, uh, that this group is actually has actually higher expression uh, than, than the Shams line. So clearly we see that this picture is not completely perfect. We're in the probably the rats are in the process of recovery but haven't recovered for uh, the entire, uh, the entire the entirety. We can uh, do uh, co-expression network analysis. So the idea here is to look at uh, genes that, um, genes that, that uh, move in the same direction, so that are co that are potentially co-expressed 
Uh, and uh, so WGCNA is an approach that does this. Uh, we can so then create this kind of, 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 um, of trees, and depending on where you cut that tree to cluster, you get different modules, so they call it modules, that are um, in re so that, that regroup group, um, different gene sets. Um, and uh, then we can go specifically for some of these modules and do the same kind of things. So uh, have box plot for the expression of these different things. Uh, so for example, here it's the magenta module that is here. Uh, and that, as you can see, it seems like in the MI groups, except for the combined treatment, we have a, a decrease of this group of gene. And the line, I don't know if you can see them, but they show the trajectory of the genes, this, each gene in, the, in these clusters. And similarly, on, in this uh, yellow um, module here, we see the opposite um, effect where, where in terms of, of uh, the, the expression going lower, uh, going back to lower expression in the combined set. So we can have a look at these things. Uh, also in terms of the correlation with traits, so again, back to the phenotyping, the cardiophenotyping, uh, or actually the phenotyping of the rats. Uh, so lots of phenotype here, and you'll see that, so for example, there's redundancy and correlation between the phenotypes, so we should definitely clean this up. But uh, here, for example, are the molecular, the, the weight for the different part of the lungs and uh, the total lung weight and so on, so they're clearly correlated. But you start to see some of those group of genes correlated with actual phenotype data from these rats. And so that's very interesting to go forward to uh, get a bit more information about what are the genes in, in these groups, of these, in these different modules, and uh, how do they affect the biology of, myocardial, of um, uh, pulmonary hypertension caused or following myocardial infection. So we can specifically go and use all the tools that we generally do in transcriptomics, going to gene ontology, for example, <coughs> here, for this uh, magenta module that was highly correlated with, uh, um, with uh, the total uh, lung weight or things like this. And in fact, in this, uh, when we showed this to our collaborators, they were super happy because this is known biology, uh, that uh, the mesenchymatal uh, uh, development and stem cells are known to be enriched when there's fibrosis in the lung. So that made a lot of sense. And so then we could also go back to our quality control uh, analysis, uh, look at, uh, so for example, the enrichment of uh, those MSC cells and find it uh, to be indeed uh, we uh, recovered as a sham uh, group uh, for our combined treatment group. So that was good news, again, um, that what we're doing makes sense. But also we had new, new groups of genes that were as interesting in some sense. Uh, in particular, I'm just showing this example here of uh, the yellow module that um, have all, uh, contains a lot of genes linked to metabolism. Uh, and digging into this uh, is, uh, is generating a lot of hypotheses, but also uh, a lot of new potential discoveries in terms of the mechanism of uh, hypertension, pulmonary hypertension and uh, whether this is possible to extend to human is still uh, an open question, but at least it's, it brings new things in terms of the entire proteome and new hypotheses for this disease and for how those treatments actually work. So I'm um, here um, uh, switching to me metabolism and metabolomics because obviously uh, starting to see these kinds of, of, of processes make us think about everything else. So we are at transcriptomic level but clearly what's really going on is also at the metabolomic level. So metabol metabolites are those small compounds in the cell that uh, are actually uh, with the proteins uh, being used to uh, uh, produce function and 
uh, and that are more closely related to also the phenotypes themselves. But the metabolomics of, of humans here, for example, the representation of, of, the, of the network of uh, metabolomics is very complicated. And now uh, we have started to have more and more data on the actual metabolomics. So the same way as we do in genomics, transcriptomics, we can also interrogate the full spectrum of metabolites within a cell. So this field is, is newer in some sense, and it needs a lot of data dev uh, method development to analyze this properly. Um, and we were lucky to also have another collaboration with researchers. So here we're back in humans, uh, where we're looking at plasma metabolomic profiles of human having had a myocardial infarction. And they took, uh, during this plateau um, uh, clinical trial, they took two drugs, clopidogrel and ticagrelor. Uh, ticagrelor is, is the kind of a, a new new medication that, uh, is in, that they were testing in that clinical trial. And uh, it's uh, supposed to be acting more rapidly uh, and have a more, so both of them are anti-platelet uh, medication, and, but it, it was supposed to be acting more rapidly, and also it, it has the advantage of not having a pharmacogenomic association, so, uh, or at least found, so clopidogrel is known to be efficient only in patients with a certain uh, genotype in a cytochrome P450 gene. So, uh, it was in, it, it's an in, interesting alternative theory. And so in this study, they had uh, one, uh, 180 individuals. They did an untargeted uh, analysis of metabolites. So untargeted means that they are, in the, the, the technology itself interrogates the entire metabolome. However, it's, it's untargeted, but it's not completely unknown because then, in the analysis pipeline, we are only looking at the metabolites that we can actually identify. So it's untargeted, but ident identifiable. So there's, of course, a big part of this data that uh, we're not looking at at this stage, uh, and, uh, but at least we have names for the metabolites we're, we're looking at. Um, so there were two stages uh, of, so two, two stages where samples were taken. Baseline, uh, when the people arrived at the hospital having had a myocardial infarction. Um, so uh, there's, as you can see, T1, T2, T3. That's, so those are, are the time since when the symptoms um, uh, started once the, 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 the plasma sample was taken. And at this chart, so it's a few days later, just before they leave the hospital, so it means that they're in a stable, um, steady state uh, at least. And, uh, and so those, the plasma samples were taken again. So those are all matched uh, um, samples. Um, so this is just to tell you that the, the experiment, the metabolomic experiment that's been done by Metabolome, that are doing a lot of pre-analysis. However, our group took the data, the raw data, and we analyzed uh, most of it, going through quality control, similarly to what uh, we do generally with genomics or transcriptomics. I'm not going to go into it, but we, we plot the data by many, using many reduction, um, um, uh, dit uh, dimensionality reduction techniques. This is PCA, you can see the data before quality control and after quality control. So after quality control, you start to see a nice separation between the baseline and the discharge groups. Uh, which is nice, and then we can start working. Um, so we decided to, uh, to approach the question in the same way as we approach transcriptomic uh, data uh, and do a volcano plot. So again, it's, uh, it's a default change, uh, the log uh, 10 p-values for significance. Here it's not very clear how to, uh, to decide on the biological significance. So I'll, I'll Oh, it's, it, it's not as clear as for gene expression that has been you know, running for a, a bit more time. Whether um, if, so for example, if we talk to, to the metabolomist, they will say that just a 30% increase in the metabolite in the cell is significant. So it doesn't need necessarily to be 
times two in order for us to make it, to think it's interesting. So we've been less conservative uh, in that sense in this analysis, but as you can see, maybe it's not necessarily uh, showing that, but, but like most of the metabolites here have changed significantly uh, in, uh, in this data set. So the p-values here are huge uh, in terms of the differences between the two matched groups. Um, and so that, that is interesting, but it means that there's lots of things and probably they're all correlated together, so we need to be careful in, in the interpretation of this. We can apply the WGCNA algorithm the same way, um, and then we see a clear picture of two groups of metabolites, so you have the blue module and the turquoise module. Um, and then one uh, aspect of, of this is that uh, for each of these modules, you can, you can uh, derive eigengene value, eigen, eigen values, uh, and, and then do a module trait relationship. So the same way we've done it, uh, the same thing we've done comparing the different cardiophenotypes before, and uh, what we've seen is that, so here, we're just comparing baseline and discharge. And we have those two modules clearly correlated with, uh, with, with the, the status of, of the patient. And in fact, you see that all these uh, metabolites on the left are part of the, the turquoise module and the blue. So this uh, makes sense that the, the, pro, the, the methods have captured this, this difference. But then we can also use these kinds of differences to uh, try to understand what are those metabolites. And the blue module seems to be mainly amino acid um, molecules. So you can see a subset here. And in the, the, uh, the blue modules, and to be completely honest, the, 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 those two, uh, for the, the turquoise module, we had a collaborator that is like, Metabolo metabolomist, and he could see right away that those were all fatty acids and that those are the ones that are upregulated or up uh, in the myocardial infraction group. Um, we can plot these eigenvalues as well for each individual. They have this value, and so here you have those values for all the individuals, uh, discharge, uh, no, so uh, baseline, and discharge, and you can clearly see the difference uh, between those two groups uh, of the blue and the, the turquoise modules. We've also, so the, the main goal of the, the, the full study, the, the clinical trial, was to uh, understand the, how the treatment, uh, wh whether there was a difference in treatment, so there was a hope here that in terms of the metabolomic profile, we would see something uh, acting. And, um, it's, uh, we, we had uh, some metabolites that seem to be significantly expressed uh, between the two groups depending on their treatment. We could also look, uh, so here you have those two metabolites that uh, uh, ended up to be significantly uh, different between the two uh, treatments, but it didn't seem to be uh, modulating the entire metabolome. Um, if we only look at discharge individuals, so the ones that are actually randomized uh, for the treatment, we can redo this uh, WGCNA approach and redo the correlation with different uh, traits, including treatments, and we see that we have a module that correlates with uh, this, but uh, it, it includes those two, in the pink module, include those two uh, metabolites. It also includes others, uh, we believe that it's mainly, the cohesion is mainly driven by uh, these two metabolites. However, we're still investigating a bit uh, these ones, but probably the, the correlation is mainly uh, linked to these two. And uh, it's, it's leading to, to an hypothesis in terms of, but it, it, it's clearly not, the treatment is clearly not changing the response, the overwhelming response that is the recovery from the myocardial infection. Um, so now we're moving uh, on also to develop new methodologies for meta metabolomic data. Um, and so one uh, approach we're thinking about 
uh, uses machine learning. Um, one of my students, uh, Emma Takla, he has used XGBoost, an algorithm, to uh, understand and to, uh, to see if, first of all, we can replicate all these, um, these analysis, or, or all these results. Uh, but the, so the response, the, the answer is yes, we are able to classify uh, those, the samples in the right category with good accuracy, but what we're also able to do, and I'm sorry, this is not a picture of that study, it's a, a picture from uh, this website, but we are also working on uh, getting interpretation by individuals. So here we know the, the big picture, and that in, in individuals with myocardial infarction and uh, after recovery, uh, where, what is moving, but we don't know especially for one individual what's going on. And using local interpretable model agnostic explanation approaches, we, we are able to, uh, to dissect a bit more uh, what for each individual uh, is causing um, the, it's causing the prediction at least. Um, my student, Quentin Baron, is also applying uh, deep neural network approaches to uh, this data set. Uh, and again, well, it, we're, we're starting with, with this, but there has been some studies published using uh, deep learning uh, methods for metabolomics. And uh, we're, we, we are not exactly sure what it will bring, uh, so we're testing them and uh, in the hope that maybe we can discover new things or confirm at least by, by uh, new methodologies uh, the results we get. So to wrap up about those two projects, uh, the first one uh, highlighted the transcriptomic signature of the combined treatment, Valsartan with PBI, that is highly beneficial compared to the other individual treatments. We've discovered new metabolic uh, pathways and processes that, are, that might be involved in the pulmonary hypertension following MI. Uh, but remember I told you that the first study was looking at recovery after three weeks and the PBI treatment was, uh, was very successful at, in that stage. And so we're wondering why an early treatment, it's not working on its own, and why adding Valsartan is helping in fact. And so we have hypothesis for that, and it, it might also bring us more information about uh, all the, the process and what each drug is actually doing. For the metabolomics project, we found clear global metabolic signature of MI uh, in human plasma with fatty acid enriched and amino acid depleted. Um, I want to highlight here that both of these things have been seen in the literature. Some of these, so some papers have reported some fatty acid to be increased. Others have uh, reported some amino acids to be depleted. Uh, but what we have here in this study is a global signature and both of these things at the same time in the same patients. Um, the type of treatment does not seem to influence the global signature uh, at recovery. So uh, for some people, it's good news. For others, it's not. So uh, we're trying to investigate that those potentially modulated metabolites that uh, are important. And maybe also going to this dark side of the metabolome, that lots of metabolites that we actually did not look at, not because they were not typed accurately, but just because they don't have a name. So we're not exactly sure. So we definitely need to go deeper into this. Um, and also, um, we, we compared our results with other uh, studies that were looking at myocardial infarction uh, uh, with patient and controls. So for example, so these are not matched. So they're, and, and most of these studies, they're looking at the metabolome or metabolites in patient, but three months after the myocardial infarction. And they are seeing differences with control. And we are looking at you know the same patient in in, in two uh, in a week. So there's this immediate repair we're probably seeing right now, but there's also the complete recovery part. And it would be interesting to see if we could actually uh, link these things together. 
But what would be even more uh, interesting is would be to, to combine transcriptomics and metabolomics. So we're trying, we're starting to see in those two different projects, two different species, two different diseases, uh, overlap, of course, of genes uh, that would be so. Some are seems to be seem to be linked to uh, to some metabolites that we're seeing and so on. So the ideal study would combine all of this in humans. Uh, but maybe in rats as well. Um, and so to understand the entire, uh, the entire picture. And so uh, clearly now I'm, uh, this is my, my way of introducing this multi-omic integration. I'm sure you, you are all uh, aware that this is probably where we want to head uh, towards. So clearly those things are not independent. Uh, and one potential approach to kind of explore multiomic uh, data and integrate uh, multi-level data is going uh, to uh, developing more um, different additional computational um, approaches and one opportunity that comes uh, because of collaboration with the MELA, the Montreal Institute of Learning Algorithm, uh, in Montreal is the uh, deep neural network. So I touched it a bit with Quentin's work, who's trying to uh, apply these methods. Uh, but the, one of the reasons why it's attractive uh, is that it learns, the deep learning is thought to potentially learn nonlinear transformation of, of the input data. And the concepts are modeled with different levels of abstraction, abstraction, which reminds us of the different biological layers uh, that we um, that that uh, we have in 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 our multi-omic data. Uh, the the problem is that in neural nets we have this uh, this input layer that um, will be the data, and that is linked to this first hidden layer, and the number of parameters that you'll have here will be a function of your input data. And since we ha the, our data has a lot of features, we're in a situation where we will have a parameter explosion in uh, this first layer of the network. And this can lead to a lot of issues. One of them is overfitting, uh, so learning by heart the data. Uh, and so um, this is a very big problems in biomedical research because we have not so many examples, but we have so many features. So for example, if we think we add genomics, so all the SNPs we know, uh, transcriptomics, so all the genes, then metabolomics, and so on, this is impossible. This is too many uh, features for not so many um, uh, examples to train our models. So one solution uh, that I'll briefly describe is uh, a new parameterization of, uh, of a neural net. So briefly, uh, this is FADS data, so we call it FAD data, uh, when you have lots of SNP in here, for example, but not so many participants. And so the idea is, for example, you have this uh, neural net um, uh, where this is the, the fat layer where you have an explosion of parameters. And if you have 100 neurons in your first layer and uh, 300,000 um, features, well, you have 30 million parameters to fit, which is huge, right? Mm -hmm. So the idea was to turn the data on its head and use that transpose matrix, matrix to uh, actually train another uh, network that will predict the weight in the first layer. So I don't have time to go too much into details here, but you see that, so we have a step where we create an embedding. So the embedding could be anything. So all these um, uh, dimensionality reduction algorithm could be used as embedding for the, and then we are training this, this uh, network to predict our parameters here. So they're not parameters anymore, they're uh, fixed values, uh, and the parameters that are used are the ones from this network that are a lot less um, 
in, in terms of numbers. Uh, so here you have this network that will make a prediction, but you can also have a network that will reconstruct the data, so in a kind of an unsupervised way. And same, to reconstruct the data, you'll need, to, you have a fat layer over here as well. So you could use the same strategy and you could train all of this together with your main network. The embedding part uh, is a choice, so you could uh, pre-compute it, and this is nice because if you have knowledge about the data, you could uh, include uh, expert knowledge into your, your, your model. You can learn it offline, so you can train these, uh, or you can learn it jointly uh, with the rest of the architecture. And if you want more details, I'm happy to talk to you about it more but it's a uh, published conference paper uh, that you can find online. So we're now apl applying uh, this, this diet net uh, to look at fine scale population stratification, uh, to do biobank studies and different projects where we have, and also for pharmacogenomics. Um, but uh, in applying deep learning methods to uh, biomedical research, we face many challenges that I think is very important to highlight in the light of the hype around deep learning. So fat data, I, I just uh, mentioned it, and other people have also developed different uh, approaches, uh, and we're thinking about different approaches to, for, for this large P, small N problem. Uh, but there's also the, the problem of having imperfect data sets in biomedical research, um, the fact that we have heterogeneous data uh, where we uh, have, well, in the multi-omic uh, example, we have data from a lot of different technologies and so on with a lot of biases. And uh, in the end, uh, the black box problem where most of these algorithms uh, are now, uh, are not necessarily designed to inform us about the biology but more about the, you know, the accuracy and the predictions, and that's not okay for biomedical research. So we're working hard to try to make these interpretable, and there are different ways of doing this uh, that we're thinking about. Uh, so with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. <laughs>